So now back to finishing up lecture five. Okay, and this is where we ended up. Right, so we had just gone through how sequencing projects work. We, di we, we discussed the differences between, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I'm going to give you an assignment for that on Monday. Um, so in lab, you should have met with your groups and formed the groups and chosen a topic, a broad topic. Did that happen in lab? So, okay, so I'm hearing different answers. So um, you formed groups, um, but that's what the end of the chromosome looks like. And, and you know, this goes on and on and on for three billion letters. And to give you an idea of how long three billion letters is, right, because it sometimes might be hard to wrap your head around that, that's the equivalent of about a thousand Bibles, okay? So people sort of have a sense of how big the Bible is, right? So if you put a stack of a thousand Bibles, that's a, a, the same number of letters as the human genome, okay? Um, I tried looking up how big, like, the U.S. tax code was. It's actually bigger than the Bible, right? So it's maybe about 100 U.S. tax codes per genome, right, just to give you an idea. Um, so that's a lot of letters. That's a lot of information. But, it, but in, a, in another sense, it's not that much information, right? It's all of the information that's required to build a human being. So, you know, maybe it does take 3 billion letters to do that. Um, but, but the other part of the point, right, is that just looking at these letters doesn't really give us that much information. So another way to look at it is this, and this, I mean, you might be saying, well, this doesn't give us much information either because it's just too, too much going on here. So let me explain what this is, and <clears throat> I'm not going to explain everything because I agree that this is sort of too much information. So this is a representation of just one of your chromosomes. This is chromosome three, okay? And so the chromosome starts over here, and then schematically it just sort of goes and goes to the end of chromosome three. And different pieces of information are shown here. So for example, um, these blue and red lines here, these vertical lines, represent where genes are along the chromosome. So there are probably a few thousand genes on chromosome three. And so because chromosome three is only taking up this much room, each gene is basically a sliver in this representation. Okay? Not all genes have been named. In fact, most of them haven't been named yet. The ones that have been named uh, that mean basically they've been studied in one way or another are shown along the bottom. So these are also in blue and in red. And they have names that aren't particularly informative for the most part. Uh, but these are genes that are associated with something someone has learned about human biology. The ones in red are associated with human diseases. So I said there are thousands of genes on this chromosome. And you can pick out the red ones. There aren't that many. There might be you know, 10, 20, 30 or so. Uh, of those genes, and those are the ones that have been associated with human diseases so far. Um, as time goes on, we expect some of these blue ones to convert to red, basically, that some, someone will discover an association between particular genes and diseases. Um, some other things you, that are shown on this diagram that are kind of interesting is, so there's this big gap in the sequence here. So you can see there's no genes indicated here, and it's sort of grayed out. Um, that's because that sequence it's known to exist. There's a sequence there, but it wasn't figured out. The letters in that sequence weren't figured out. Why do you think that was? Did they say, oh, we're busy with other things? Did they say, oh, it's good enough for government work? What, what's the reason why a sequence might just be absent from Would the database? Be no. So this is. Right, so this is in order along the chromosome. So this is a big chunk of chromosome three. It's probably you know five percent of the chromosome. So you know maybe hundreds of thousands of, of letters right in a row. So uh, much bigger than any one gene, right? But it's grayed out because that sequence is not known. Why do you think it, it's not known? What sequences are hard to figure out? Repeats, OK? So this is actually the center of the chromosome. Um, it's what gets grabbed onto when the chromosomes are dividing. It's called the centromere. And that tends to be a very, very repetitive sequence. So, so basically, the Human Genome Project punted on it. They said, you know, we can't do it. It's a big gray box. It's too hard, OK? Um, what else is on here? So the other thing I told you is that um, 
ten, about 10% 10 of your genome is made up of one particular repeating element called an alu element, okay? It's only 300 base pairs long, but there's so many copies of it that it's basically 10% of your genome. That's an element called a sign element, so that's shown here in red. And what this trace here is, you can see it sort of has peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys. Wherever there's a peak, there's good evidence there, that there's one of these repetitive elements. And you can see basically peak, 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 peak. All along here, there's, there's you know, many places along this chromosome where there's just some random insertion of one of these re repetitive sequences. Okay, so for, for people who study genomes and who look at things like this all the time, this is a very useful representation because it encapsulates an entire chromosome and you can see sort of how the genes are distributed, how repetitive elements are distributed. But for our purposes, it's, it's way too complicated because it still doesn't really distill down into information, okay? And so what we're gonna be talking about over the next, you know, uh, lectures in the course is, is how we get down to representations that are actually useful to us. And so on the next slide is, an, is a representation that I think is actually much more informative than any I've shown you so far. And so the way this works is that once you have the genome sequence of a human, what you can do is then you can find all the genes or try and find all the genes. How do you think, if you, if you don't know anything about a gene, how would you sort of recognize that it was there in the genome? If, if all you have is a DNA sequence, how can you find genes? How do you think you would go about doing that? Hmm? Where are so it would be where proteins are created, and if you just have the letters, how could you recognize those places? Right, so, so one thing, that's exactly right. One thing you would want to look for is, <coughs> excuse me, places in the genome that read ATG, okay? Because ATG corresponds to AUG in an RNA and therefore corresponds to potentially the start of a protein, okay? But as you know, there's two problems right there, okay? One of them is that AUG doesn't necessarily have to be at the beginning of the protein. It, it codes for the amino acid methionine. That's always at the beginning of the protein, but it can be in other places in the protein as well. So it doesn't necessarily say, if there's an ATG, that's definitely the start of the protein. And the other thing is that ATG is only three letters long, right? And so if you find all of the places in the genome that read ATG, there are gonna be many, many millions of those, right? So you'd have to do, a little bit more than that to find places that are likely to be genes. How could you do a little bit better than just finding a start codon? Uh, find those places that are coming after a stop codon? So you can find one that comes after a stop codon, the, the reasoning being that Right, so, so basically, basically what you're saying is, is genes sort of have punctuation. They have a beginning and an end, and one way to find a beginning is to look from the last end and go to the next beginning. So, so that's a reasonable thing to try and do, but it has the same problem as just finding an ATG, because not only are, is there one stop codon, there's three stop codons, so the probability of finding any one of those three random collections of three letters is really high, so there are gonna be millions of things that look like stop codons in the genome that aren't really stop codons, okay? So how can you, how can you sort of keep improving? Basically, what we're doing here is we're building up an algorithm. We're saying, well, how would we scan along a sequence and find a gene? So part of our algorithm is we're gonna to wanna to find start codons and stop codons. How do you think we can um, make our algorithm better? How long is a typical protein? How many amino acids? Any guesses? <laughs> Someone rang in, now you have to answer. <laughs> Any guesses for how long a typical protein is and sort of number of amino acids? Just yell out a number. 300? Good guess, good guess. So. The, the average sort of smallest size for, for a protein is probably 50 amino acids. You usually don't get proteins that are less than, say, 50 or 100 amino acids. You can get proteins that are gigantic, that are, you know, thousands of amino acids, okay? But there are a lot of proteins that are in that ballpark of a few hundred amino acids, okay? 
So what, how could you use that to your advantage in this algorithm that we're making to find genes? Yeah, exactly. So basically, you find your start codon, and then you start translating. You say, okay, methionine, and then whatever the next one, the next one, the next one. And because three out of the 64 codons are stops, it's actually very likely that if the sequence is not a gene, you will hit a stop codon very quickly. Okay? Your chance is about three in 64, so one in 20. So if, if you just have a random stretch of sequence that's not part of a gene, then it's likely that when you start at a start codon, you're only going to get, say, 20 amino acids before it says stop. Okay? And that usually does not correspond to an actual protein, because that's too small. Okay? So basically, what you can look for then is start codon, ATG, and then no stop codon for at least, say, 100 codons. Okay? If you have that, it's very likely you have a gene because that protein has to be something that functions and therefore has to have at least, say, 100 amino acids. Okay? And that's basically the core of the algorithm that's used to find genes and genomes. And that's how we get an estimate. Even though people haven't studied every single gene in the hum human genome, we have an estimate now of how many genes there are. And it's around 25 to 30,000 genes. Okay? What this also allows you to do then is, so now you can scan along the genome and find probable genes, right? And so now you have a collection of 30,000 genes. The other thing that's really important that you can get out of these sequences is, that is just by looking at the sequence, you can usually tell something about the function of the protein. And this, this isn't something that necessarily had to be true, but it turns out to be true. And the reason it's true is that we now have databases of proteins. And what's been discovered is that proteins that do the same thing tend to have very similar amino acid sequences. Okay? And so if you gave me a protein sequence, I could type it into the computer, do a quick search, and say, aha, uh -huh, the protein sequence you gave me corresponds to an enzyme of this type, or it corresponds to keratin, or collagen, or any of the other you know, many, many proteins that are found in your body. Okay? I can usually do that to some amount of accuracy. And in fact, the accuracy is depicted on a view like this. So what this is is a pie chart of if you take all 26,000 genes in the human genome and what their proteins are that they encode, you can sort of classify them roughly according to what those proteins are doing, okay, what the function of the proteins are. Now, it's not perfect, right? This whole pie piece here, which is about 40% of all proteins in the human genome, is a big category called unknown. Okay? What that means is you search for that protein sequence in the database, and there, there's nothing that comes out that looks like it, and so you can't assign a function to it. Right? But for the other 60%, you can do a pretty good job of finding what the function is. So, so this pie piece here, which is about 10%, is enzymes. So these are amino acid sequences that look like they encode an enzyme. right? That, um, and there are various types of enzymes that we've already discussed in the class. They're the enzymes that turn, you know, um, DNA into RNA. There are enzymes that break down sugars and fats and proteins. There are enzymes that build all these things up. And so about 10% of the genes in your genome encode enzymes. Right? And we can go all the way around the circle and find interesting things. There's uh, about 1% of the genes encode something called a transporter. We've already seen an example of a transporter in the class when I talked about how fly eyes become red. Okay? Uh, the mutant that was isolated at Columbia about 100 years ago, that was basically the start of modern genetics, was a white-eyed fly. And the reason it had white eyes was because it wasn't transporting the pigment, the red pigment, to the right place in the eye. Okay? So there are actually about 1% of the genes in your genome, or almost 2%, encode transporters of various things that move other molecules around, either from outside the cell to inside the cell, from inside the cell to outside the cell, and so on. Okay? And so um, you can take a look at some of these other categories. You might not understand um, every single one yet, but we might touch on them through the course. An interesting one is this one here. So there are about 0.3% uh, of the proteins in your genome, or about 100 proteins in your genome, are actually proteins that a virus wants you to make. Okay, these are viral proteins. What that means is that at some point in time, a virus infected a human being, 
okay, whoever the human being was who was sequenced, right? Virus infected that human being. Some viruses, what they do is, the, is they're made out of DNA, and, and one of the things they do is they insert their own DNA into the genome, and then the genome thinks it's its own DNA. That DNA gets replicated every time the cell replicates. It gets transcribed just like a, a normal human gene, and so uh, you get you you start making viral proteins, okay? Um, and so uh, bad news: about a hundred of the proteins that are encoded in your genome are actually something a virus wants you to make. Okay, that's just to give you sort of a snapshot um, of of what the genome is made up of. It's made up of genes doing various tasks, um, and as the course goes on, you'll understand different examples of genes that are doing different things. Another way to look at sort of what the genome looks like is to look at the portion of it that actually is made up of genes, and I've already hinted at the fact that this is actually fairly small. So um, your genome uh, is uh, about three billion bases in total, okay? And so if you break this down into how many of those letters are in exons, that is uh, roughly in the protein coding parts of genes, how much of it is in introns, that's sequences that are spliced out of RNAs before they're translated, and how much of it is just sitting in between genes, um, it might actually be surprising to you. So um, the biggest category is how much of the genome is between genes, okay? Seventy-five percent of your genome is not in a gene, okay? It's just between genes, and there might be various parts of this. Some of it is actually indeed junk. It's doing nothing except uh, being part of your genome. Some of it is these repetitive sequences we've talked about. Some of it is these viral sequences I just talked about. Some of it, um, which is what we'll talk about later in the lecture, is actually doing the job of telling the cell when to transcribe the genes that are next to it, okay? And we'll talk about these kind of what, what are called regulatory sequences. And then um, if you look at the part that's actually transcribed, so about a quarter of your genome is transcribed quarter of the letters of your genome eventually make it into a pre-messenger RNA. Um, most of that actually is in introns and gets spliced out before the RNA goes to the ribosome. And only 1% of the genome is in exons. So one way to think about that is, you know, the, the protein coding information is only one one-hundredth of your genome, basically. Okay? And so I've shown you sort of a schematic before of what exons and introns look like, but I didn't do it quite to scale. So a better scale picture of what your genome looks like is a whole lot of blue, a whole lot of sequence in between genes, okay? 75% of the genome is in between genes. And then if you're, if you're in a place where there's a gene that is a sequence that's transcribed, um, the red part are the exons and the green part is, are the um, parts are the introns. And so this is a, what a typical gene might look like. It might have, say, four exons that are tiny compared to these introns that are in the original messenger RNA before it's spliced. And then when it's spliced, you just get this, uh, this put together with this, this, and this to get this tiny little messenger RNA that goes to the ribosome. Okay? Um, and one of the study questions asks you to compare this to um, sort of a, a compact genome, that of the fruit fly, where these percentages are different. Okay. Um, any questions about that? If not, we're going to move on to lecture number two of today. Okay. <coughs> okay. So basically, the science that emerged after it became feasible to get entire genome sequences is what we now call genomics. Okay? And we've already discussed the first two questions here. How is the genome sequenced? How much of it is actually genes? Um, and really what's going to occupy us for the rest of the class is what do we do with this sequence? How do we actually improve the kind of experiments we can do to find out things about human biology or the biology of, it, of other organisms on the planet? Um, and how do we extract information in general from sequences like this, okay? And so what I'm going to talk about next is a really powerful way of understanding the function of cells and tissues within your body by understanding which genes are active or not active, okay? And this is something that's going to come back later in the class, too. It's a really, conceptually, it's a really important concept, um, 
and and practically it's something that's done you know in in many many labs now to try and understand how um, how organisms are functioning okay and the concept is one I've, I've said before, and I'll say it again because it's so important, and that is that every cell in your body has the same DNA. Okay, so what makes these cells different is which RNAs they're making, right? And so when we say that a gene is making an RNA, a shorthand for that is that the gene is active, okay, it's making an RNA, or usually in the biologist lingo, we'll say the gene is expressed, okay? Um, so if I say, you know, the gene for hemoglobin is expressed in developing blood cells, what that means is that that gene is transcribed in those cells, and therefore the RNA is present so it can be translated into a protein. Okay. Now, we already talked about one example in class uh, where you, you can use the, the, the sort of inherent uh, ability of DNA or RNA to make complements with, with a strand that uh, has the sort of opposite base on it. Okay, so if you know the sequence of one strand, you know it'll pair up with another strand where A's pair with T's and G's pair with C's. Okay, and that complementarity is a really powerful experimental tool because it allows you to take one sequence that you know and find other sequences that are complementary to it. And we already discussed one example of how you do this in terms of building the library to, to do genome sequencing in the first place. Okay, today we're going to talk about another use of this complementarity that allows us to measure how active genes are. Okay, um, and as I said, just to sort of define another term, this whole science of getting genome sequences and using them is called genomics. Usually, that's broken down into getting the sequences and looking at the sequences without doing any experiments. That you can call genomics, um, and using the sequences to do more experiments, okay, to understand the function of, of various genes and proteins, and that's usually called functional genomics. And the first article that's not your textbook that you're supposed to read in conjunction with this lecture um, in the title of the article is, uh, it's called something like Gene Chips, of Gene Chips and Functional Genomics, okay? So, so that's what functional genomics is. It's using genome sequences to do more experiments. Um, and what we're going to talk about right now is the major technology currently that's used to measure gene activity uh, for the entire genome, and that's what's called a microarray. Now, I had to insert this word, the major technology currently, because as of today, that statement is true. As of next week, next year when I teach the same course, it might not be true anymore, okay? The technology is moving so fast that... Um, the way we study different questions changes quite a bit. And you saw from, from Paul's lecture last time about sequencing, the technology is just improving at this amazingly dramatic pace, okay? And so um, things change, but the concepts that we're going to talk about are sort of universal and enduring, okay? So the fact that next year you might not actually be using something called a microarray to do the experiment I'm going to describe to you now is, in a sense, irrelevant. What's important is sort of the conceptual basis of it. Okay, and here, here's, here's the way it works, okay? Um, and so this is the, the article um, that, you're, that you're supposed to read along with this lecture, okay? And so imagine you have two different cells. Um, you have one that's been treated with some kind of chemical, say a drug, okay? So let's say you're working in some medical laboratory and you're testing out drugs to see if they're effective um, on a particular type of cell, and maybe the first step of that is to figure out if the drug is toxic or not toxic to human cells. So you can grow human cells in a Petri dish the same way you can grow, um, uh, you know, bacterial cells. The medium's a little bit different, but you can do it. Um, I think someone posted from, on the blog already, an article that came out last week. If not, someone should post it. Um, a new book came out about the life of the woman who was basically the source of the most commonly used um, cell line for humans and still is the most commonly used cell line. And it's a really sort of fascinating and a little bit disturbing story of how sort of her consent was not given and, and her tissues were taken without her being informed what they were used for. And now they're, you know, these cells, basically she had a type of cancer that meant her cells would d divide forever in a, in a Petri dish and that's really useful 
because then you can keep a culture of these cells going forever and different labs can use them and you keep getting more and more of these cells and everyone could study the same thing. Um, and so uh, that's all well and good except when the patient that those cancer cells were derived from didn't, didn't know what was going on and her family was sort of not informed either. So anyway, a little bit of a sidetrack, but the idea is that you can grow human cells in a dish, you can grow bacterial cells in a dish, um, and you can imagine that a type of experiment you might, might want to do is to test out a drug on human cells to see either if it's effective in doing what you think it's supposed to do or if it's toxic and therefore is not a good candidate for development as a drug. So we can imagine doing an, ex an experiment where we have some cell that we're treating with some drug and then a control cell that's untreated. Okay, So we're going to do a comparison here between the treated and the untreated cell. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to measure the RNA that's produced by both cells. Because if we find genes that are active in one cell and not the other, that's going to tell us something about how those cells are responding to this particular chemical. Okay? And so that's what's uh, shown schematically here. You have the DNA, which in this example has five genes on it, but you know that there are about 30,000 genes. Um, and in this cell, the treated cell, gene 1 is producing RNA and gene 4 is producing RNA, but genes 2, 3, and 5 are not. Okay? So gene 1 and gene 4 are active, gene 2, 3, and 5 are not active. Okay? And you only see one RNA molecule here, but the way to picture it is that there are a bunch of RNAs corresponding to gene 1 and a bunch of RNAs corresponding to gene 4. And then, of course, those RNAs get exported from the nu nucleus, they go to the ribosome, and they get converted into protein 1 and protein 4. Okay? Whereas in this cell that was not treated uh, with this drug, gene 1 is still active, gene 4 is not active, but gene 5 is active. Okay? And because of that, you get protein 1 and protein 5 instead of protein 1 and protein 4. Okay? So basically, the way to sort of think about this is that protein 1 is not affected at all by the experiment. Right? It's not affected by whether the drug is added or not. You still get protein 1 made in those cells. So you can think of something that something like that is usually called a, a housekeeping gene. It's a gene that's just sort of always there keeping the cell in order. Okay? Um, it's not playing any specific role um, in, in, in the response to a particular drug. Okay? But protein 4 is a protein that's only made in the presence of the drug. Okay? You can say that it's activated by the drug. And protein 5 is a protein that's only present in the absence of the drug. Okay? So a way to say that is that the expression of protein 5 is repressed by the drug. It's the gene 5 is inactivated by the drug. Okay? And so th the idea is that you can learn a lot by doing this. You can say, well, the treatment is obviously doing something. It's making protein 4 present and protein 5 absent. And if you know something about protein 4 and protein 5, then that'll tell you sort of what effect that, that drug is actually having on the cells. Okay. For example, what it, you know, if protein 4 is a protein that's made only when cells are about to die, then this is probably a toxic drug. Okay. And if protein 5 is something that's really important, likewise, if protein 5 is something that's really important for cells and it goes away when you add the drug, then that's a bad situation too. And so the way we do these experiments is we measure the RNA and we assume that these RNAs would then get translated into those proteins. And that's, in general, not always true, but it's a, a decent assumption to start with. Okay? And so um, I've described this as a situation where you're taking an untreated cell and a treated cell and doing this. Um, but the power of this type of experiment is you can do any comparison you want. So instead of taking a drug-treated cell and an untreated cell, you can compare two different cells, normal cells, in the same body. So you can take a liver cell and a muscle cell and do the same experiment. And what this will tell you is it'll tell you the proteins that are important for liver function versus muscle function. Okay. Likewise, you can take the same cell type but at different stages in its development. So you can, uh, let's imagine you're doing an experiment on a mouse now. You can take mice that are uh, seven days old as embryos. Um, and take their developing kidney cells out and figure out what genes are expressed. And you can do that seven days later. You can do it at embryonic day 14. So you have these two samples. Both come from developing kidney, but they're at different time points. And by seeing the different genes as they're expressed along that progression, then you can say, well, 
you can sort of start to understand how the kidney actually develops. At the early stages, it's making certain proteins, and at later stages, it's making different proteins. And if you can really understand in a, in a sort of tight time course how that's happening, then what you understand is how a kidney is made, because you understand this progression of different proteins uh, being expressed in these cells as they're developing. And um, another example is you can compare, say, a healthy tissue to a diseased tissue. Okay, and so this is something that's done a lot nowadays, um, and we'll talk about examples of this later in the course, but you can imagine uh, if you're studying breast cancer, for example, then what you might want to know is how are breast cancer cells different from normal cells, okay? And so you can get healthy tissue, get the cells from it and figure out what genes are active, and you can get cancerous tissue, get the cells from it, figure out which genes are active. And if you find genes that are active, for example, only in the cancerous tissue, then that'll, that might help you do two things. It might help you diagnose cancer at an earlier stage because you might be able to detect differences in gene activity before you actually detect in a biopsy that something is wrong. Okay, so it gives you opportunity for diagnosis. It, it also gives you an opportunity to try and identify targets for therapeutics. Okay? For example, if you know a certain protein is only made in cancerous tissue, then that becomes a target for a drug treatment, okay? And that helps you design drugs to, to deal with that, okay? So that's the power of this method, that in, in a sense, whatever biological question you're interested in, you can apply this method of finding out which RNAs are being made uh, to tell you something about uh, differences between different tissues, okay? And you can listen to one of the interviews on the DVD to learn more about that. Okay, so how does it, I haven't told you how it actually works. I just told you there's this wonderful, powerful method that allows you to do this. So how does it work? Um, so the way it works is you build something called a microarray, okay? And the, and the concept is very simple um, if you think about it just for one gene. But what makes it powerful is you can do this in parallel for every gene at the same time, okay? And so this is what you do. In our example, we have five genes, but you have to say, okay, five is really 30,000. And for each gene, we can make lots and lots of copies, that's what's meant by amplify here, of, of its corresponding DNA sequence. So you can imagine a test tube that has many, many copies of gene one, just the sequence that's part of gene one, a different test tube that has many, many copies of gene two, and so on, okay? How would you get many, many copies of, of a particular gene sequence? Right, so the one way you definitely know is to make, is to take that sequence, insert it into a plasmid, insert that plasmid trans into bacteria. You transform the bacteria with that plasmid. You grow up lots and lots of bacteria, which then gives you lots and lots of that plasmid, and therefore lots and lots of that particular DNA sequence. And so you could have a plasmid for each, corresponding to each gene, right? That's actually not how this is done, but it doesn't matter, okay? Um, the idea is that if you have a particular DNA sequence, nowadays it's routine, it's easy to get lots and lots and lots of copies of that particular DNA sequence. Then what you use is a fancy robotic machine um, to de deposit those contents of those different test tubes on a microscope slide, okay? And so you all know what a microscope slide looks like, okay? It's about that big, right? And the idea is that you can make little droplets on that slide corresponding to each gene, okay? So the way you do that is you start out with a bunch of plates that look like this, right? Um, so this plate has 96 positions in it, right? And so when you were doing your pipetting in lab, right, you have one tube and one tip, and you take it and do that. So that's really slow if you had to do that 30,000 times, right? So instead we build machines that do it very fast. So the first thing you do is instead of having one tip at a time, you have 100. You have 96, 12 by 8, okay? And so you have a machine that has a bunch of tips all in a row. And, and nowadays you can get a machine that, for example, has 12 tips all in a row, or you could probably even get one that has 96 tips all, all together, okay? So you can basically go into this plate, and each one would correspond to a different gene, pick up a little droplet, and deposit it onto a glass slide, okay? 
And you need a pretty good robot to do this because the glass slide is really tiny and you're depositing tiny little drops, so you have to be very precise in how you're doing it. And the idea is not just to put five drops on a slide, but to do it really densely so that you get um, you know, on the order of 30,000 spots on the slide. And you'll see what this looks like in a second. So, so now you have what's called a microarray, and it's called microarray because it's very small spots, and they're arrayed on this slide, and you can imagine having 30,000 spots on the slide all corresponding to a different gene. Okay? Here's the experiment you do. You take your cells, so your untreated and your treated cells, um, you grind them up, uh, for example, in a blender. You know how to do that. Um, and you get the RNA. So you're not getting the DNA, you're getting the RNA. Okay? And remember, these cells are making different RNAs. Okay? So here you have a bunch of RNA1 and RNA5, and here you have a bunch of RNA1 and RNA4. Okay? What you do is you label each of those RNAs differently, and you actually do this with a color. Okay? And so you take the untreated cells, and you, um, and you make copies of, those, of that RNA. And while you're making the copy, you insert these green fluorescent tags. Okay? So you haven't heard yet of copying RNA into DNA. In a way, it doesn't make sense, right? Because DNA gets copied into RNA, and RNA gets translated into protein. So why would you ever make RNA back into DNA? Turns out the culprit, again, is viruses. There are viruses that turn RNA back into DNA, and that's how they insert themselves into your genome, for example. Okay, so there are enzymes that exist that copy RNA into DNA, and those are useful because that allows us to sort of make a replica of the RNA that's present in a sample. And while we're copying that, we can insert this color tag so we know that, that everything that's green came from this untreated cell. At the same time, in a separate tube, we take all the RNA from this cell, we copy it back into D DNA. That's called cDNA, or complementary DNA. And instead of using the green fluorescent tag, we use a red fluorescent tag. Okay? So now we have basically uh, a replica of all the RNA that was present in this cell, colored green, and all the RNA that was present in this cell, colored red. Okay? We mix those two together, so now they're all in one test tube. But we know where each one came from because they're labeled green and red. And then we wash that over our microarray slide. Okay, so you can imagine submerging this glass slide we just made in this solution. Okay? So what's going to happen? Now, what happens is that DNA or RNA likes to find its complementary sequence. Okay? So everything that comes from gene 1, so this, 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 this is going to find that spot corresponding to gene 1, okay? just because the sequences match. They're complementary to each other. Okay? So those cDNA1, cDNA1, cDNA1 are all going to find themselves over here if you give it enough time. Okay? In our samples, we didn't have any representatives of RNA2 or RNA3. Okay? Those genes were not expressed, so those two spots are empty. And we have cDNA4, um, but that only comes from this sample. Right? You can see only red tags here. And we have cDNA5, that only comes from this sample. You can see that over here. Okay? So now you can already see that this is giving us some information, right? Wherever we find red and green together, that means there wasn't a difference between the two samples we started with. They were both making that RNA. Wherever we see neither, there's not a di difference either. Neither cell type was making that RNA. But if we see only red or only green, then that's a real difference between these two different cell types, okay? So th the, in this case, this is a gene that's activated by the drug. And this is, a, this is an example of a gene that's inactivated by the drug. Okay? So again, these are tiny spots. So we need some way of reading the color that doesn't depend on our eye looking at this, because it's way too small for your eye to see. So what you use, similar to what we used with DNA sequencing, is a laser. Okay? And what the laser scanner can do is just register how much color of any particular color there is present. Okay? So what it does is it scans over the entire slide looking for green. Okay? And where does it find green? It finds green on spot one and spot five. Okay? So you get it registering that there's green there and green there and not there. Okay? And then it scans through again looking for red. 
it finds red in spot one and spot four, okay, and not in two, three, and five. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, usually what we do is we display this image overlaid with this one. Okay. So wherever you had red but not green, it looks red. Wherever you have green but not red, it looks green. Wherever you had neither, it's still blank. And wherever you have red and green together, it's yellow because red light plus green light equals yellow light. Okay. So, okay. So that's the basis of the technique. I want to show you the clip from your um, DVD so you get a sort of more visual of, of what, uh, what this looks like. The grid you can see in this microarray slide is actually composed of 30,000 individual DNA dots, each targeted to match a specific human gene. In order to work out which genes are being expressed, messenger RNA is first extracted from the cell sample and copied back to DNA using an enzyme. This DNA, called cDNA, is complementary to the target gene, so will associate with it or hybridize with it on the slide. After labeling with a fluorescent dye, the cDNA is washed over the slide. The genes currently active in the cell can then be identified by the level of the fluorescence and the color of the spots. Okay, any questions about that? That's, you sort of get how that looks? All right, so, so basically, and this is from, from your article, not only do you get whether green is present or red is present, but you get a quantity, you get a number, you get uh, um, not a qualitative view, but a quantitative view of how much of a particular RNA was present. So, you can, so when the scanner gets, gives you a color in the end, it can range from fully green um, which means that that messenger RNA was only present in that in that green cell type that where the RNA was labeled green um, to fully red. The message was only present in the other cell type, and you can get everything in between. So you can get something that's mostly green but a little yellowish. That means there's a lot of activity from that gene in the green sample and a little activity of that gene from the red sample. Okay, all the way through yellow, which is equal amounts of activity from the two samples um, to something orangish, orangish where there's a lot of activity in the red sample and less activity in the green sample. Okay? And so we represent these as colors, but they could also be sort of numbers in a spreadsheet, basically anywhere from 100% green to 100% red to 50-50. Okay? Um, and this is what an actual sort of scanned image of a microarray looks like. Okay? You get spots of varying intensities. Okay, because, for example, you might have a gene that's expressed very, very much in both cell types, when, and then you'd get a bright yellow spot, right? Okay, you could have a, a gene that's active to the same extent in, in both samples, but at a low level. Okay, it's low, low activation in one sample, low activation in the other sample. That would also be yellow, but it would be a much fainter yellow. Okay, so something like that, right? And then. The things that, that jump out to you as an experimentalist, right? You know, you do your experiment, and you, what you're looking for is the greens and the reds. Okay, so it's these spots here that are really exciting. That's a gene that's active in one cell type and not in the other cell type. Uh, and likewise, these reds are ones that are uh, active in the other cell type and not in the first cell type. Okay, and you can see how reproducible this is because these are three of the exact same experiment done three times. Okay, and you can see that the colors line up if you sort of try and, you know, unhook your eyes and, and, and look at all of them at once. Green, 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 right? So these images are basically giving you the same information. They're giving you very good quantitative information about gene activity. And it's not just one gene, it's every single gene in the genome is being uh, queried at the same time. Okay? So what that allows you to do is then to find patterns. So if you were just studying one gene, you'd have to sort of know what gene to study in the first place. But by studying all the genes at once, you can go in and just sort of find out, right? It's, it's, it's what we usually call in biology a screen. It's, it's a way of sort of looking for answers without knowing what the answer is going to be 
uh, to begin with. We're just gonna ask for every gene in the genome, are you different in these two different cell types? Now, the difficulty comes in and sort of, you could stare at one of these for a really long time and try and pick out all the green spots and all the red spots, okay? But that's not a very efficient way to take these data and then find the interesting genes. So instead, what people do is they have, they use computer algorithms to organize these spots, okay? These start out in random places. Different genes are in whatever position on this, on this grid um, as they came off of that robot, okay? Uh, not in any particular order with respect to the experiment you're trying to do. And so one way to think about sort of how to organize the data is to rearrange the spots so that all the green spots go together and all the red spots go together. Um, and that's going to give you information about genes that are sort of behaving the same way in this treatment, okay? And we're not going to talk about this too much today, but this is just to give you a flavor for the kind of information you can get out. Later in the course, when we talk about using this technology for diagnostics in medical settings, we'll go into detail about how you generate pictures like this. But basically, what this picture is, in a sense, is a reordering of this picture, okay? Putting all of the green ones together, putting all the red ones together, and, and throwing out all the yellow ones, because the yellow ones aren't so interesting to us because the treatment doesn't affect those genes. And so you can read more about this in this article, but basically what it allows you to do is to say, do a bunch of experiments. So the rows here are individual genes. So this picture is showing a blow up of, you know, maybe 15, 20 genes, okay? And each column is a different experiment. So you can imagine that the other powerful thing about this technology is, is that you, you don't just have to compare two things, you, just, you know, treated and untreated, but you can keep doing the same kind of comparison. Let's say you are always comparing to untreated. You can treat with drug one, you can treat with drug two, you can treat with drug three. And so what these columns are, are different experiments like that, all comparing to the same control experiment, okay? And so you can imagine that class one is a set of drugs that all elicit the same response in these genes, and class two is a set of drugs that all elicit the opposite response in these genes, okay? And depending on what these genes do, this might, might mean class one is good and class two is bad, or class two is good and class one is bad. For example, if these are all genes that are induced by toxic substances, right, and red means active and green means inactive relative to the control, then the class two drugs are bad, okay, because they're activating these genes that are this sort of signal that says, uh-oh, uh, uh the cell identified some toxic compound, right? probably not a good drug to actually use on people. Um, whereas class one is good because the expression of these genes stays low or maybe even goes lower and so those cells are, you infer those cells to be happier or healthier, okay? So that's one of the types of ways of interpreting diagrams like this. And, and as you'll see in the article, what it allows you to do then is to screen through sort of the toxicity of drugs, for example, without actually having to do experiments on people. Right, because you can take liver cells and grow them in a dish, add the drug, get the RNA, do these experiments, figure out which drugs sort of behave in the same way. And if you include in that, in that panel of drugs, drugs you already know are either toxic or not toxic to humans, and then you can classify them this way. And you can say, well, okay, one of the ones I included in class one was a drug I know to be safe, and one of the drugs that gives this pattern is a drug I know to be toxic, and then everything that clusters over here with that one known toxic one is a drug that you would not pursue anymore because it's, it's, it's not a good candidate for using on humans, whereas the drugs that fall over here that look like they're not eliciting this toxicity response are ones that you would pursue, okay? And so that's what they call in this article a systems approach to toxicology, okay? You take a panel of known drugs with known effects and you do these microarray experiments on them and you get a certain profile of some genes being on and some genes, or some genes being uh, inactivated, some genes being activated relative to healthy tissues. Um, and then you get um, new data, okay? And th those might have sort of a different set of genes being activated or inactivated, okay? And what you're looking for is sort of matching up these patterns. Okay, and so uh, once you take 
you know, drug A and see what its pattern is, and drug B and see what its, pa its pattern is, and drug C and see what it pa its pattern is, and you know what the effects of these drugs are, then you take some unknown drug, some drug that hasn't been tried yet in humans, you do the same thing, and you ask which one is it like, okay? And for example, what's shown here is a case where the pattern of gene expression from this unknown drug is most similar to the known drug A, okay? Because it has this red, 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 green, green for these genes, okay? That's sort of the pattern that's associated with gene with drug A, and you see that in the new drug that you found that you're trying to see if it's going to be worthwhile to pursue, okay? And that much matches drug A response much better than it matches drug B response or drug C response, okay? And so then you would say, well, if A is a drug I know to be safe and effective, then this compound might be something I want to pursue at my pharmaceutical company. If A is a drug I know to be a complete failure and toxic and lead to all kinds of problems, then this thing goes back on the shelf never to be studied again, okay? So this is really powerful because it can accelerate research. If you don't need to use living animals or human patients to actually determine whether a drug is toxic, these experiments can be done a lot quicker and with a lot less regulatory hurdles than actually experimenting on, on people, okay? And so it's a way to accelerate drug research, okay? And basically where it all leads is um, to this notion that um, up until very recently, the success story of, of modern biology is, is, is uh, this paradigm that we usually call reductionism. The idea that you sort of break components of a, of a living organism down into their most elemental pieces and understand those. So an example of that is, is one you did in lab last week, which is figuring out the genetic code. The genetic code is not some property of your liver or you know, some complicated organ. It's sort of this essential property of DNA and RNA and proteins and how they're made. And so uh, just by figuring out that this codon, U, 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 code for phenylalanine, right, um, that's sort of the essence of reductionism. You go down to the most sort of basic, smallest components within the cell and understand those, okay? And what's been happening, and that was, that, that's been enormously successful in figuring out sort of the basics of molecular biology. But what's been happening recently, now that we have genome sequences, that now that we have technologies where you can look at every gene at once and its, its activity, um, is a, a, a sort of turning around and a, more attempts to sort of appreciate functioning systems as a collection of many genes acting together, okay? And so that's what's sort of shown on this diagram from this article that appeared in Science a few years ago, um, where you try and understand the activities of genes, but that's not sort of the end point. That's the beginning. Because as I said with the example of this developing kidney tissue, right, the idea is that if you can get enough information about what, what genes are active when, then you can build that up into relationships between genes that are usually active together, proteins based on what their inferred functions are, enzymes, structural proteins, other things that might be working together. And that gives you a much more sort of sophisticated and, and, and complex picture of what a cell is doing. Which genes is it turning on when? How are those gene products, those proteins, working together to actually make a functioning cell? How do cells go together to make functioning organs? How do organs like hearts and livers and, and lungs get all tied together to make functioning organisms? Um, and so this is what we usually call now systems biology, the notion uh, it's sort of the opposite pole of reductionism. It's trying to collect a lot of information and synthesize it so that we have an appreciation of what are usually termed higher orders of organization, okay? Not just sort of this one gene and what it does, but how that fits into the context of a functioning cell or organ or organism. Okay, lecture number two, done. <coughs> okay, so. The last thing we're going to talk about today is the classic example of a gene being activated or inactivated um, in a sensible way based on what the organism is trying to do, okay? And so basically, what we're going to talk about right now is this one question of how do cells turn genes on or off, okay? I've already told you that it's a really powerful experimental method to understand when genes are on or off. Okay, because that tells you something about how the cells are working. 
But I haven't told you how the cells know. How do the cell know? How does the cell know when to turn a gene when on and when to turn a gene off? Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about now. These questions are where we're heading. Okay, um, because this example is sort of a classic example from bacteria. It'll be your first introduction to really, you know, sort of a real set of organisms and how they deal with their environment and and how different aspects of diversity are actually achieved. And then we're going to move into talking about um, how this one example of, of a single set of genes sort of can be generalized to how sort of entire bacterial genomes are organized. Um, and then ask questions about, because bacteria in a way are sort of our most simple living uh, organism. Um, and they can tell us a lot about sort of what the basic functions in a, in a cell are that are required to actually live. Okay? Now this again is sort of a deep philosophical question. What's sort of the core of life? What, what are the minimum requirements to actually have a living thing? Right? And, and using the tools of genomics, we can actually start to get at that question by trying to figure out what the minimal genome is. You can see that if you understand the minimal genome, you sort of understand what the minimal requirements for life are, because the genome encodes all the information for that cell to be alive. Okay? So that's another direction we're going to be heading in, which is using what's known about bacteria um, to try and understand what, what, what are the core functions of life? What does it take to, to actually be a living organism? Okay, but for today, what we're going to finish with right now is this question of how do cells know when to turn genes on and off? Okay, and the example, as I said, is this classic example from E. coli cells. E. coli are the ones living in your gut, okay? And as you might imagine, they love sugar, okay? Uh, sugar is an excellent source of energy, okay? And so e, e. coli cells have numerous mechanisms uh, that they use to take in sugar and use it as an energy source, okay? And so one of the sugars they can use is a sugar called lactose, which you know as a component of milk, for example. Um, lactose is, is a simple disaccharide. That is, it's a sugar that's made up of two simple sugar uh, uh, units. Those two sugars are galactose and glucose, okay? And so um, in order for E. coli to use lactose, it needs two proteins, basically, okay? It needs one protein, which is an enzyme called beta-galactosidase, and the job of that enzyme is to break lactose into its two component sugars, okay? Uh, if you have a test tube with lactose in it and you add this enzyme, you get galactose and glucose, okay? Um, that's the first step in, in E. coli using uh, this sugar for energy, it, it needs to first convert it to galactose and glucose, okay? And so beta-galactosidase is sometimes a um, mouthful, and so we abbreviate that as LAC-Z, as you'll see in a second. Um, the other protein that E. coli needs is what's called lactose permease, okay? Lactose permease is actually a channel that sits in the cell membrane of the bacteria. So this is an E. coli cell. <laughs> Okay, pushing me off the stage, right? And so the DNA might be over here, say, and in order for lactose to be used as an energy source, um, it needs to get inside the cell, okay? And normally the cell membrane is impermeable to lactose, that is lactose will not diffuse across the cell membrane. And so it actually has to go in through a special channel called lac lactose permease, okay? Now, E. coli are smart, okay? They only make these two proteins, beta-galactosidase and lactose permease, when lactose is present. Okay? So here's my little table, uh, which is probably overkill in summarizing this statement. Uh, if lactose is present, then beta-galactosidase is present. That is, the protein beta-galactosidase can be found inside the cells, and lactose permease is present. If lactose is absent, then beta-galactosidase is absent, and lactose permease is absent. Now, why, why does this make sense? Right, there's no need to have those proteins, and so that's sort of a, sort of a human way of thinking about the problem, right? So from the point of view of the cell, what, the way we would probably say it is that um, the whole point of using lactose is for energy. So if you, every time you transcribe a gene, every time you translate an RNA into protein, it takes energy, okay? And so it's a waste of energy for the cell to be making this protein and this protein if it's not going to be using them, 
Okay, so another way to say that these, are, these proteins are present or absent is that the genes encoding those proteins are transcribed or not transcribed. Okay, and this is the way the regulation happens. This is the way the cells control whether those proteins are present is they either make the RNAs corresponding to those genes or they don't make those RNAs, okay? And so the way the production of beta-galactosidase and lactose permease is controlled is that when lactose is present, these two genes are transcribed into RNA, and when it's absent, they're not transcribed, okay? This is basically saying what I said on the last slide, but this is the mechanism. This is how it's actually doing the control. If lactose is present, these two genes are transcribed, and if lactose is absent, the genes are not transcribed, okay? So just a quick check to see if you got the microarray part of the lecture, okay? Let's say I do a microarray experiment, and I have two spots on my microarray, okay? One of them corresponds to the beta-galactosidase gene, and one of them corresponds to the lactose permease gene. Okay, I have these two spots. Then what I do is I take E. coli cells that are growing in lactose, and I get their RNA, and I label it red. And I take E. coli cells that are growing without lactose, and I get their RNA, and I label it green. Okay, lactose sample red, no lactose green. Okay, first question. So then you go through the whole microarray experiment, right? You label red, you label green, you mix them together, you wash them over your microarray slide, which has these two spots on it. You use a laser to scan how much red and how much green there is, and then you get a value that's somewhere between red to yellow to green, okay? That's the experiment, right? First question, will the color of these two spots be the same or different? So will the beta-galactosidase spot be the same color as the permease spot, or will they be different colors? They'll be the same. Why? Because the same rules apply, right? They're both made when lactose is present, and they're both not made when lactose is absent. Okay, so we have these two spots, right? And we know they're going to be the same color, so now let's just say, okay, there's only one spot. Right? Just sort of simplify to understand what's going on here. So we have this one spot, let's say it corresponds to beta-galactosidase. And I told you that the the lactose-treated cells, are their RNA is labeled red, and the no-lactose cells, their RNA is labeled green. So what color is the spot going to be? All right, this requires clickers. Okay, left hand up or right hand up? So left hand is the spot will be red. I'm going to review what the colors mean before I force you to raise your hand. So left hand spot is red, right hand spot is green, both hands spot is yellow, okay? Everyone got that? Red, green, yellow, okay. So the RNA that comes from the lactose present sample is labeled red, and the RNA that comes from the lactose ab absent sample is labeled green, okay? We mix them together, we wash them over our micro slide, right slide, which has one spot that corresponds to the beta-galactosidase gene, okay? So I'm going to count down three, two, one, and then you raise your hand. Red spot, green spot, yellow spot. Ready? Three, two, one. Wonderful. Mostly. <laughs> okay. The answer is it's a red spot, okay? Because we have these two samples, and the difference is that in the lactose treated sample, you're actually transcribing the gene, so you get that RNA. It's labeled red. When it's not transcribing the gene in the lactose absent sample, you would have labeled it green, but there's no RNA to actually label green. So the only thing you have is red labeled RNA, and so the spot's going to look red. Okay? Give yourself a few examples of that, you know, to sort of work out as your own study questions. You know, think about gene regulation and what color the spots would be. Okay. So in the remaining time, what I want to discuss is how the cell actually does this, right? How does the cell know to turn the gene on at the right time, okay? And if you remember when we were discussing what the definition of a gene is, I said, well, there's the stretch of DNA that actually corresponds to the messenger RNA. That gets transcribed, okay? But then there's these other sequences that are next door that control when the transcription actually happens. And I called those regulatory sequences, but I didn't say much more about those, okay? And so 
this is how the, the lactose genes, which we sort of shorthand to lac genes, are, are actually regulated. This is what the DNA looks like, right? The two protein coding sequences are actually right next to each other on the chromosome. We have lac Z next to lac Y. Lac Z is the beta galactosidase gene, and lac Y is the lactose permease gene. They're actually transcribed in the same messenger RNA, so they're made at exactly the same time. Okay? And then when the ribosome translates them, they're translated into two pieces, so you get two proteins. Um, there are these sequences over here that control when that happens, and when transcription happens, you get the two proteins. Okay, so what's over there? You know, that's where the business is going on. That's what's telling the cells to transcribe or not transcribe. Okay, and if we blow it up, um, we can break it down into actually two sections of this regulatory gene. They're both colored different shades of blue because that's what I'm representing here. These are the, the, the regulatory sequences that are next to the coding sequences to these genes. Okay, and these two elements are called P and O. Uh, P is what's called the promoter. The promoter has a very precise definition. It's the place where RNA polymerase attaches first and starts making an RNA. Okay, a way to think of it is it's the beginning of the gene. Okay, it's where RNA starts being transcribed. So the very first letter of the RNA is where the promoter is. And so in cartoon version, this is the way to think of it. There's a purple blob called RNA polymerase. It attaches to the promoter, and then it starts transcribing and making this RNA. Okay? And you can see that this is the beginning of the RNA. It came out of the polymerase first, and this is the end of the RNA. It's coming out last. Okay? So that's how the gene is transcribed. Now we have this sequence O called the operator. Now that's near the promoter. And it's a place where another protein attaches. And in biology, when we, when we say binds, we mean attaches, physically touching. Okay? And so there's another protein that I haven't told you about yet called the lac repressor, or lactose repressor. And that protein attaches here. Okay. So what happens if there's a protein attached there? Well, it's actually a physical block. Okay? So that's my lac repressor in this sort of stop sign shape. Okay? If the lac repressor protein is attached to the operator and an RNA polymerase attaches to the promoter, the RNA polymerase can't get anywhere. That is, it can't transcribe the gene because it's actually physically blocked by the presence of this protein. Okay? So, all right, so now we have these two pieces, and that's actually all you need to devise a system to transcribe these genes when lactose is present and not transcribe these genes when lactose is absent. Okay? So think about how you might do that Okay, if you were the cell. What, what would have to happen? Which, which part of this system has to be controlled by the presence or absence of lactose? Exactly. So the as I showed it to you on this slide, the polymerase is going to bind to the promoter no matter what, and then it's just a question of whether it can get past this block to actually transcribe the gene. So the thing that you control to determine whether these are transcribed is whether the operator is attached to, whether the repressor protein is attached to the operator or not. Okay? And so how might lactose affect the operator? How might it affect the repressor protein? What would it have to do? So, so one possibility, right, is if, so that's a good answer, right? It, if, if when lactose is present, this protein is not present, then the polymerase can get straight through the gene, right? So that's close to what happens, OK? But if you think about it, uh, that's sort of a slow approach to solving this problem. Because if you degrade the repressor every time lactose is present, then once lactose is absent, you have to remake, retranslate the repressor. Okay? So it's not actually what cells do. Instead, what happens is lactose changes the shape of the protein. Okay? And that's reversible. Okay? So in my cartoon version, you can imagine the state that's happening when lactose is absent. The repressor is bound here, so the polymerase get can't get past. That makes sense because you don't want those genes transcribed if there's no lactose around. Okay? 
lactose comes into the cell. And even if you don't have permease, a tiny bit of lactose can get into the cell. Okay? And the lactose is attracted to the repressor. Okay? And so the mechanism could have been that that would sort of destroy the repressor. Right? But that's not what happens. Instead, what happens is it changes the shape of the repressor. 